mind. So if you place your finger on your outlines right now, you should be in Arabic number two towards the bottom. You have capital B, the second warning. And then you scroll down capital E that he is superior to Aaron. I'm, I'm speaking about the outlines right now. Hello, Bruce. And then go to Arabic number two, a better priest. It goes from 5.1 to 7.28. This is a very important section. Make sure that you place your finger at that place. Arabic number two, a better priest. And we covered actually, we did, um, we entered into the third warning, failure to progress to maturity, 5.11 to 6.20. So we covered 5.11 to 14. I will say a few things and then we carry on with the warning here. The third warning to fail to progress to maturity, which is very, very important. The session tonight and the session uh, <clears throat> of next week are crucial for you to attend and at least to re, uh, re watch the content of them. This will prove crucial because this is perhaps the most debated passage of the entire New Testament, actually, okay? So that's why it's going to be quite uh, serious to go back to these things, all right? Deborah, good to see you, Monica, Bruce, Dan, Wilson, Deborah, Einstein, Deborah, Catherine, not Catherine, but Bob, beautiful, thank you for coming tonight. We'll start with a moment of prayer in a moment, short prayer. And like I said, uh, I didn't have time to write it down on the, because I had some technical difficulties right five minutes ago with my Zoom meeting, so, but now it's getting a bit better, so I'm glad about this. I'm going to rectify all things with uh, Jason tomorrow. All right, beautiful Randy. Randy's there. Are you still there, brother? Okay, good. So on the outlines, everybody is at the same place. Under Arabic number two towards the top, a better priest, find that out. We are between 5.1 to 7.28. And we started, last time I saw you, the third warning, failure to progress to maturity. And what we did cover that I review right now in a moment of time, we did cover from 5.1. 11 to 14. We covered that part. Before I pray, like I said here, the author goes his way to show the superiority of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, to angels, okay, to um, Aaron and the Levitical system, uh, to Aaron precisely, superior to Aaron as a high priest, and he will be also superior to the Levitical system, which are the three pillars of Judaism. So that's why it's important to do the work that we do. And tonight we're going to get close to the most difficult passage to explain containing Hebrews chapter 6, verse 6. So that's why I need you full concentration. Father God, thank you so much for the privilege again to be able to meet in this capacity with the people that are willing to learn and willing to apply what we learn together. We confess that the teaching of the scriptures in depth view or in depth look at it is not always easy to understand. Almost impossible without your spirit. So that's why since we have the abiding of the Holy Spirit within us, being the temple of the living God, you have basically make us capable to understand the deep things of God. But for this, we need to be clean with you, confessing that uh, we are sinners, asking you for forgiveness for daily sins, make our clean slate, slate clean and come to you in humility and learn. It doesn't take months. As soon as we acknowledge this, it's done. We're clean. So Father, we plead your help. Teach us your ways. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the third warning, parenthetical A, the third warning in bold character, place your finger in your Bible at 511. I'm just going to read this uh, 5.11 to 14 and then em embark into the new section, which will be 6.1 to 8. Concerning him, in verse 11, Melchizedek, we have much to say and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. 
For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, because he is an infant. <clears throat> but solid food is for the fully grown or mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. That was basically the warning as soon as he wanted to explain the doctrine of Melchizedek. He could not explain it to them because he's, he knows that they are still in a state of immaturity. And now he deviates from the goal to get, to give that warning here. And the warning you have, it's written, written down in bold, failure to progress to maturity. Just to summarize that part here, they have been believers for a long time. The Hebrew people, they have been the people of the Hebrews. They have been believers for a long time. They should be teachers by now. But they reverted from adulthood back to infancy or babyhood, if you prefer. No losing of the salvation, sheer immaturity. Because they lack a usage of the meat of the word of God, so therefore it keeps them, in, them immature. And we can relate to that because in our churches today at large, in North America, we have a lot of people that have remained in babyhood here. So resulting in regression from maturity to immaturity. So that's the summary of chapter 5, verse 11 to 14. Because the warning goes down at the end of the chapter 6, from 5.11 to 6.20. Okay? Now I will slow down the pace somewhat, and I would like you to make the notes as much as you can, because I'm bringing you towards the, the famous verse of Hebrews chapter 6, verse 6, that the people use to teach the losing of salvation. There is only one way to counteract this, and it's to make a deep study of the passage that comes before this, and that's what I am doing just right now. Can you hear me good, all of you? Okay? Good. Good stuff. Good. Come with me, chapter 6, verse 1 to 8. We are still on bold character, the third warning, failure to progress to maturity. Come with me, circle a few things. No comments, just circle. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ... Let us press on to maturity. Circle, press on to maturity. <clears throat> Not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works, circle works of faith towards God. Of instruction about washings, circle the word washings, whatever you have there, you might have baptisms, plural. And laying on hands, circle laying on hands. And the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment, circle it all. And this we will do, if God permits. Verse 4. For in the case of those who have been once enlightened, circle enlightened, and have tasted, circle tasted, of the heavenly gift, and have been made partakers, circle partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, circle tasted the good word and the powers of the age to come. And then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put Him, Christ, to open shame. No comment so far, nothing to circle. For ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it, and brings for vegetation useful to those, vegetation useful to those of those for whose sake it is also till, receives a blessing from God. But if it yields thorns and thistle, it is worthless and close to be cursed, and it ends up being burned. This is a very important section. In the previous section, what do I mean by this in chapter 5, verses 11 to 14? Shows that they were in immaturity and they have a basic need, which is crucial right now, like for all of us, to need to grow. The passage that I just read is maybe the most debated, debated passage in Bible studies. This is what we like to avoid, and this is that almost 100% of the cases, almost, 
they pull them out of context. So we need to be very serious as we engage into that passage. Before I get into the passage, there is three principles to keep in mind. You want to note them. Three principles to keep in mind in this difficult passage. The first principle is this, that chapter 6, verses 1 to 8, what I just read is chapter 6, verses 1 to 8, needs to be handled in light of chapters 1 to 5. You need to leave it in its place. You cannot isolate that passage and not taking in consideration what we have achieved so far, which are chapters 1 to 5. It needs to be handled in light of this. Still on the first principle, these guys, I mean by this, the recipient of the book of Hebrews, are believers. They are Jewish believers. That's why the title is Hebrews. Still under the first principle, they are contemplating going back to Judaism to avoid heavy persecution from fellow Jews that are not messianic. Basically, they thought, the recipient of the book of Hebrews, not you and I, they thought that they can leave their salvation and resave later after the, the persecution subside. They thought that receiving a new salvation will erase the sin of having departed from it, would erase the apostasy of leaving that. So, verse 6 can, cannot be isolated, okay? This is very crucial in Bible study because you have a lot of small groups in places and if a non-believer hears that you can lose your salvation by Hebrews chapter 6, verse 6, and if that new believer is, he is immature because he is a new believer, he will believe it because if you read it isolated, it makes sense. If you isolate the verse, try it. Just cut and paste that verse, put it on a Word, a word document. If you read it, it makes sense that you can lose your salvation. But this is exactly the way it should not be taught because of the famous law of the overall context. So that's why we need to have to, a lot of work to do. The totality of what I just said is the principle number one. The second principle before we attack this is going to take two sessions, by the way. It's based upon what we call the immediate, immediate context. And the immediate context began in 511, 511 to 14. That's where it began. This is the primary immediate context of the, of, of the, of the passage. It's a pressing on to spiritual maturity. That's the context. Write it down properly. The context is they need to press on to spiritual growth. Mature in Christ. If they don't, they are on the edge to make a bad decision. If they refuse to give close attention or to pay heed to the, to the author of the book here, they may make a bad decision, imitating the sin of Kadesh Barnea in Numbers, that generation is dead, but what they want to do is to go back to Judaism so that the people will see them, them in the temple compound and they will say, oh, look, he left his messianic stuff and he came back with us. Okay? And they might remain in a state of immaturity. And more than this, they might die physically in a state of immaturity. Write that down. That's what they face right now. If they go back to Judaism, they will face a physical judgment, not spiritual judgment, and they will die in AD 70. And it would cause them to die in immaturity, losing rewards for the Messianic Kingdom. Write that down. That's the totality of my second principle. And what I just said is not difficult. 
What I just said is in light of chapters 1 to 5. If you don't study the book and you isolate Hebrews chapter 6, verse 6, you will end in the field. It's guaranteed, 100%. You will give it a false explanation. The third principle, the Bible has no contradiction, specifically in the realm of salvation. If you take the Bible as a whole, I'm going to give you some passage. The Bible teaches eternal security. The Armenians on that point are not correct. They're wrong. As over, you, you always compare the Armenians to the Calvinist. Calvinist is not perfect, but the Armenian, they strongly believe that you can lose your salvation. This is improper teaching. It cannot be accepted this way. Okay, if the Bible teaches eternal security, one verse cannot negate the many. What's the many? If the Bible teaches eternal security, only one verse, such as Hebrews 6.6, 6, cannot negate the many passages that teach eternal security. Do you understand what I mean by this? God bless you. Okay? You cannot isolate Hebrews chapter 6, verse 6, start a doctrine where the rest of the Bible or scriptures, many of them, teaches eternal security. I'm giving you passages right now that I'm not going to read that teach eternal security. Colossians chapter 3, verse 3. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. Romans, you highlight this one. Romans chapter 8 verses 38 and 39. This is very strong, maybe the strongest. John the Gospel chapter 10 verses 27 29. That's the passage that you cannot be snatched out of the hand of the Messiah, nor of the hand of God the Father. Okay? It's double eternal security. Question for you. Don't answer. You will answer in your heart. You were born physically. Can you undo it? You were also born spiritually. That's what we call being quickened in the spirit. Can you undo it? You were slower to answer. As much as you cannot undo your physical birth, you do not have the capacity to undo your spiritual birth. Simple as this. This is undebatable. Be re rejoice in this, in a sense. If you are ready with me, do this. I embark the passage slowly, the best of my ability. I'm not nervous, but I'm trying my best. My struggle right now is not nervous, n nervosity, to be, ner to be nervous. My struggle right now is to be able to slow down, to communicate properly. And I have a a bronchitis right now, so it's, it's double the energy for me. You come with me in chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, circle therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Messiah, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and, and of faith towards God. The word therefore connects to the passage before. What's the passage before? Why is it therefore? It's therefore because of chapter 5, verses 11 to 14, the pressing on to maturity, the need for progression. What they need to do is to use the knowledge that they already have. And this is good for us. What they need to do is to put in use what they know already. But now they have become dull of hearing, 
So they need to press on to spiritual maturity. I will never stop saying this. Simply because too many churches today are not working, they pretend to love their congregation, but as a pastor in the realm of the Christian faith, you cannot love your congregation if you do not direct them to press on to maturity. It's not the love of the, of the Christian faith. If you love your brothers and sisters as a shepherd, his work is to lead his congregation to maturity in Christ, not to himself. The word leaving in verse 1, circle, therefore leaving, in Greek it means to abandon, to forsake, or to put away. So what they need to abandon or to put away for now, it's very finicky here, it's the ABCs of the faith. They need not to abandon them in the sense of rejecting, but once you know, I just emphasize with you, that you cannot undo your spiritual birth, leave it alone. Why? Leave it alone. Don't discuss that anymore. It's a fact, and this is the ABCs of the Christian faith. Now we need to move on together. Beloved, you cannot live your Christianity with the fear of losing it, and every time you, you think about it, you're not strengthened in the faith. So that's what they need. They need to leave the ABCs of the faith and move on to the ribeye on the barbecue. One inch and a half thick. A real meal. Beloved, God loves you. Yeah, God loves me. It's a done deal. It's good to remind, but what, what, how can I pay back? And we should not pay back. How can I show now my love for him? What is he, requ what is he requiring of me and you? Because he loves you. Francois, if you love me, press on to maturity and apply what needs to be applied. It, loving the Lord, it's not raising your hand on come thou fount of blessing, of every blessing. This is nice and moving, and when it's well sang and so on. Loving the Lord, it's digging, seeking to know what is applicable and moving on. Good. This is what they need to do themselves here. Because in verses 1 and 2, he addressed the ABCs of the faith. He uses six things, three sets of twos. Three sets of twos. What's the number two? Yeah, twos. Number two, six things, okay? I, I, I mean, we are elaborating on that right now. The first two, call them one, one and two if you want, they concern conversion. Okay, come with me. The first two are in regards to conversion, the conversion to faith. Number one, not laying aside, okay, circle laying aside, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ. Let us press on to maturity. Not laying again a foundation, circle this. Not laying again a foundation. A foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. <clears throat> the negative aspect of not laying aside again a foundation of dead works here the ne negative aspect of the conversion is the Levitical, the Levitical system. Everything that relates to giving sacrifice here is dead works now, in their time. Because they don't need the Levitical system anymore because Christ is the final authority. Christ was the final sacrifice. So they don't need to, re to go back to something that was good but now they should press on to maturity for something that is better. So because they want to go back to the Levitical system, killing animals here, this is dead works right now since Christ died. 
The positive aspect here, and keep in mind that the law was temporary. I'm going to teach the covenant soon. The law was temporary. When Christ died, he nailed the law, the parchment of the entire Levitical system, the 613 commandments. They're finished. He nailed it to the cross. Why are, we, why are they trying to go back to this? Faith towards God is the positive aspect of conversion here. When it says circle, faith towards God. That's the positive aspect in the realm of conversion right here. Okay? Faith and once and for all, your commitment in the Messiah. We're not the people of Hebrews here. But once and for all, press on to maturity with your commitment that we have done together to their Messiah. Faith, once and for all, a commitment to Christ. This is salvation indeed, in his trusting in his finished work. Too many Christians today are caught up in work, in do, doing Bible study to gain brownie point, embark as elders, deacons, and 10 months after that, everybody is worn out, everybody is tired, everybody feels obliged to go to Bible study. Don't embark in everything. When you begin something, finish it properly and then move on to the next. Because we do nothing to perfect our salvation because our salvation is perfected in Christ. There is nothing, to, there is nothing that I can do to be good. I, your, François, you're good because I am in you and your life is in me. Do, but don't do to be good. You're good already. Try to quit the mentality of, of even the way I brought up my Sophia. If you do good ice cream, this is the Mosaic law. If you do good, I'll buy ice cream. This is conditional. And since you are good, you know, I will buy ice cream anyway. I forgot my terminology here, but it doesn't matter. This is my two point here. Stop doing stuff in the flesh. And that's the temptation of these Hebrew people right now to go back to Judaism. I'm done with the two comparison, the first set of twos right now. I'm done. The second one is ceremonial elements. Ceremonial. Elements. Now we will see the text coming alive again. We dealt with this. Number three and four, or one and two if you prefer, doesn't matter, concerning uh, ceremonial elements. Teaching on baptism. Of instruction, verse two, about washings. Some of you might have baptisms. Plural, circle the S of instruction about washings and laying on hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. That's what we do. Teaching on baptism or washings, the Greek word there is immersions. And the Jews know, they know what it means that you immerse yourself prior to offer your sacrifice. You do all kinds of washings, the washing of the hands, and all the mosaic institution that the high priest needs to change his garment before entering the Holy of Holies and death, he gets into a ritual cleansing. When the woman finished the menstruation system, she needs to be re-immersed for the cleansing to receive the blessings of the Temple Mount and so on. To the, to the author, to the recipient of the book of Hebrews, they're not going to ask the author what he's talking about. They know. It's a Jewish book. So baptism, it's not water baptism. It's not the baptism of John the Baptist. It's not the baptism of the Father, the, the, the Son, and the, the uh, Jesus, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's not it. It's all the, the, the principle of immersing, cleansing from sins. They want to return to this. That's the cleansing system under the law. And once they, they renounce Judaism, when they are immersed and baptized by the, Holy, by the Holy Spirit and baptized by the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that's the final decision to, to, to surrender Judaism. 
So they know what, it's, they, what, what it talks about and they know the importance of it. Because in Judaism, baptism has the principle also of identification. So once they identify themselves with Christ by means of baptism, it's a once and for all break from the Judaism. And they did it. Number four, laying on hands. This is the Old Testament way of appointing a priest. Okay? Appointing a priest. And it carries over in the New Testament when you appoint deacons and when you appoint elders. It also has the connotation of identification. Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 1 verse 4. When they release the scapegoat, the priest places his hand on the head. It's a transference. He identifies himself with the goat that will be killed or released. So it's a transference of the sin of the nation to one animal that will be sacrificed on behalf of the, of the nation. So laying hands has a principle of identification. More than one principle of identification is one of them. You can impart blessing, number one. That's why lay your hands on your baby type of thing. Okay, you impart blessing. It can be used the laying on hands to appoint somebody to the office in the New Testament, deacons, deacons and elders, and the principle of identification. If you be careful with this, if, if you lay your hands on a sick person at the hospital, I'm not saying don't do it, but be uh, be careful here that this is a principle of identification with the person. Okay, just be careful with this, not to do it too often. This is the two things. They are willing to go back to uh, Judaism and so on. They know what the, the, what the uh, person is talking about. And still in verse 2, it's eschatological. What is eschatological or eschatology here? It's the doctrine of the end times. That should be also behind their belt forever, like you and I, okay? Like we read verse 6, and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. This is considered by the author of the book of Hebrews, the ABCs of the Christian faith. When I teach Revelation, oh man, you were so in-depth. It was so in-depth, not at all. It's the milk. You will be raptured and you will get a new body, period. Get to know your covenants, get to know your dispensations, get to know Melchizedek, get to know the freedom that you have in Christ, get to know the principle of not causing stumble and so on. The fact that you, are, you will be resurrected with a new body, it's not even a Sunday morning men's breakfast discussion. But we argue over it. The fact that there will be a messianic kingdom, a thousand year reign, which all the churches, almost all of them, did allegorize, should not be a, a Sunday morning discussion. It's behind the belt. It should be a discussion for those who just arrive in the realm of the faith. When you have a new convert in your church, beloved, you cannot keep them bay for 10 years. They can do Alpha once, but then you move, you move them to Bravo and Charlie. And this is our responsibility of those who are taught, teach what you're learning. So when they debate about these things, that's the other says. This catology they should have, because the doctrine of resurrection, it's in the OT. I'm giving you the scriptures right now. Job 19.25. When's the last time we read Job together? Did you know that there is a book in the Bible called Job? Isaiah 26, 19. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. The eternal judgment, God will punish sin. It's an Old, it's an Old Testament doctrine as well. Do you think that they can read the account of the flood, these guys, of Genesis? They can read it in the original language. Do you think that they can read the account of the opening of the, of the earth in Numbers when they were judged by the earthquake that swallowed them alive, Dayton and so on? 
They can read it in the original language. We don't read it in our language. So these are things that God will judge. God will judge. That's, that's basically it. So it's amazing to see that these six things for the authors considered as the elementary principle. They're good principle, but you cannot abide them forever. Verse 3. And this we will do if God permits. The if God permits, we will do pressing on to maturity. If God permits is in the first class Greek condition. It's a sense. He does. He permits it. He permits it. Look what's happening right now. Here. Here. I cannot allude to the, the, those across the street. It, it's Wendy's. It's happening there. They do food. But here we do a different type of food. It's happening. And this is smack in the will of God. What we are doing right now as a small cluster, none of you right now, since we entered the meeting at 6.30 together, together, question if you are in the will of God or not. You did not do, do it. Because you know, and we know together, that you are in the will of God right now to dig and to, do, to go deeper in the text. We have grown together to a sense of maturity that we don't question that anymore. I need to learn these things. I'm going to share it with my spouse and so on. When I evangelize and when I am asked to speak, need the, asked to lead a devotional, that's the word that should come from the heart. Not your Mustang 1965 fully restored. I have nothing against that. But that occupies too much of the men's breakfast. Mm, that's okay. He wants us to leave the ABC. You come with me? Verses 4, 5, and 6. That's in your seat belt. I'm going to try to be good with this. Let me drink a bit. Where's my water? Leave, give me a moment. I'll be back. Verses 4, 5 to 6. Ay, 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 Father, help me with this. For in the case of those who have been once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gifts and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers, plural, of the age to come and then have fallen away, it is impossible to re renew them to repentance since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. In the Greek text, in the Greek text, the sentence, it is impossible to renew them to repentance, is at the beginning of verse 4. In the Greek text, it comes at the beginning of verse 4. Doesn't matter, because we don't read the Greek in a sense here. The lapse will not accomplish with what they think. Okay? The return to Judaism, the departure to, to go back to Judaism, will not accomplish what they think. It will not the, the, the make subside the, uh, the persecution that they do. Okay? It's not going to work. What they are willing to do to go back to the sacrificial, sacrificial system, because the temple is still operating, it's AD 66, it's not destroyed yet, they live in Judea, in the vicinity of the Temple Mount. What they want to do will not work. Another piece of information, verses 4 to 6 is one long sentence in the Greek. It doesn't have a break. It's one long sentence here. I would like 4, 5, and 6, I would like to look at the five spiritual privileges. Five spiritual privileges. They are in what we call aorist tense. Aorist tense. It's a Greek construction of tense. Once and for all, past tense. Greek aorist tense. It means that they are completed actions. The five privileges that I speak to you right now are done deal for the recipient of the people of Hebrews here. 
These are things, the five things that they did experience. Okay? They did experience it. Number one, you circle once enlightened in the verse four. It refers to regeneration, new birth. Hebrews 10.32. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 32 says this, but remember the former days when after being enlightened, when after being enlightened, when after being enlightened, you endure a great conflict of suffering. Being enlightened, ask the question about you. Bob, have I been enlightened? François, Bruce, have I been enlightened? The answer to that is yes, and it's not repeatable. It means that you have been saved. That's why we have the word here. Let us, uh, verse 4, for in the case of those who have once, once been enlightened, it's not repeatable, okay? It's taking hold of the truth, and it's to possess the truth. Are they believers? Yes. Number two, you circle in verse four, tasted of the heavenly gift, okay? Tasted means to really have experienced it. Go back to chapter two, verse nine, when it says Christ tasted death, he did not just nibble on death. He did experience it. These guys tasted the heavenly gift. Okay? They did not only nibble on it. They experienced the goodness of God. That's the second privilege. The third one, you circle with me partakers. It's chapter verse 4c at the end. Partakers, it's to have a real participation. Not only close to it, but really partaking of it. Not being close to salvation, but being partakers of it. To become a real participant in the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. They got it. Number four, you circle the word here. And I've tasted the good word of God in verse 5. The good word of God, the Hebrew word is rhema. Not Hebrew, but Greek. It's the spoken word. They heard the apostles, some generation of them, some people, they heard the words of the apostles. And maybe the word of Christ also for the older and so on. Some of them might have heard the spoken Lord like, like Peter did at the Mount of Transfiguration. Not these guys, but maybe around. Because it's 80, 66, 68. Right now, Christ was crucified in eighty thirty, So it refers to the Rema here. Number five, the power of the age to come. Number five, the powers of the age to come. The age to come for them is the Messianic age. No question about it. It's the messianic kingdom. You're not going to make friends if you teach this. The age to come is the messianic age. The Jews, they believe in two ages. The age in which we are in right now since the creation of man. That's why they are in year 5000 and something. And the age to come is the messianic age, which has not come yet. So they experience basically issues that will be seen in the age to come, some such salvation and so on. So, why did I take my time with the five spiritual privileges here? Is to show you that they are truly saved. That's all, before we attack verse 6. It's a terminology for believers. Never use of mere profession, but always in reality. And the reality it's for those who have been enlightened. It counts for all of you. Everything that you have said, the f that I have said about the five privileges, it does apply to you, except hearing the audible vo voice of Christ or Peter and so on. You have tasted, you have become partakers, and so on and so forth. Verse 6, we have the time to take it. I know it's warm. I can see you being hot right now. Bear with me, please. Okay, verse 6 says, And then I have fallen away. It is impossible to, read them, to renew them again to repentance, 
since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame here. This is the famous verse, often misused, that we come to here. There are at least 10 interpretations of it. I'm not going, going to go through the 10, but I'm going to re-emphasize the one that is valid in the context here. Okay? I'll do my best. Basically, before I expound on this, there are two reasons for the impossibility of renew them to repentance. There is two reasons for them, for the impossibility to redo, redo them to repentance. Okay? It's impossible to renew them because of two reasons. The first reason, it requires a re-crucifixion. It demands for Christ to be re-crucified. The re-crucifixion of the Messiah. That's the first reason why it's impossible to renew them to repentance. It's not going to happen. The Messiah will not die twice. And the second one, it's to expose him, Christ, to open shame. Because if they go back to Judaism and try to redo their life again here, you expose Christ to open shame because you say to Christ, you die once and it was not fine, it was not completed, it was not the finished work. So you open Christ to open shame. So that's the two reasons for the impossibility to redo them to repentance here. There's basically two views in the correct view. It's based upon what we call the wider context. And the other one, it's in the immediate context. Both are good for the, the, the verse 6. I will elaborate. If they go back to the Judaism, AD 70 is coming and they will die in a physical judgment. AD 70 is on the way and they will die in the physical judgment. So why impossible to renew them to repentance? I explain. The Messiah can, cannot be re-crucified and to put him to shame, to open shame, basically it's to tell him that his final work was not done. I start with the wider context. That's the wider context right now. The option they thought they had to go back to Judaism until it subsides and come back to Christ, they do not have that option. They cannot re-crucify Christ. They cannot re-give their, their life to Christ after leaving Christ and coming back and so on. That doesn't work. The first alternative in the wider context is to press on to maturity. And that's what the author does encourage fully. The second alternative would be to go back to Judaism like they would like to do. They will not lose their salvation, but it's to be placed back to the physical judgment of AD 70 to come. If they go back to Judaism, they're placing themselves in the context of imminent physical death. Physical death, not spiritual. And since it is impossible to go back to an unsaved state, this is impossible to go back to unsaved, salvation is forever, they either stay there and regress or press on to maturity. It's either or. You stay there, you remain in immaturity, or you press on to your maturity. The losing of salvation is not possible. That's the view of the wider context. What's the immediate context right now? They must press on to maturity. And this started, the pressing on to maturity started in chapter 5, verses 11 to 14. In chapter 5, 11 to 14, the other spoke of babyhood. The other spoke of babyhood and wasted years. And the wasted years in babyhood. Because the wasted years in babyhood brings forth thorns. We will see that in 7 and 8. The wasted years in babyhood and immaturity brings forth thorns when they should be producing good crops right now. 
by moving on to spirituality. If back to Judaism, it means if they go back to Judaism, they don't lose their salvation. It means permanent immaturity and physical death in spiritual immaturity. What's the losing? Rewards. If they stay there, they will die in immaturity. How many times I went to some funeral, people close to death, pro, the, the good and bad, but the bad was that they were afraid, afraid of facing death, questioning sometimes their salvation. Should not be that way. And if they stay there, they will die in sheer immaturity. Let me say a few words concerning falling away. Circle falling away in verse 6. Most people take the word falling away and they give it an expression of soteriology. Soteriolo soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. They take falling away and they say that it concerns salvation here. It is a great mistake in attempting to solve the difficulties of this passage, of this warning. This is, this is not the proper way to face the difficulties of the passage that we are doing right now, to give it a sense of soteriological sense. Falling away, it's basically a disobedience in that context here. Let's talk about the word repentance. In the same verse, it's impossible to, to renew them to repentance. Most people, when they see the word repentance, they think right away salvation, salvation when you came to Christ. It's applicable that way, but not always. Repentance means a turning away, changing our mind. So when you decide to quit smoking, to quit this, to quit this after 30 years of Christianity, is your decision soteriological? Is your decision concerning your salvation? No, you change your mind against something. It's not proper to watch this movie. So to, to give it the taste of the repentance here, being soteriological, it's not proper. Go to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 17. Come in, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 17 with me. What does he say? For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought with tears. That's the issue of the Old Testament, the birthright. Esau and Isaac. When he, when he says no place for repentance, meaning it was done deal. He blessed Jacob, not Esau. It's not repentance unto salvation here. Again, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9. And Luke 17. Chapter 3 to 4. Okay? So falling away here, don't give it a sense of soteriology. Okay? Disobedience may be, but not the losing of salvation. They must press on to maturity. And what we need to keep in mind here, and I finish with this for those who need to go, keep in mind Kadesh Barnea, the sin of Kadesh Barnea. What was true of the Exodus generation that did, did, that did believe the false report of the 12 spy, what was true of the Exodus generation is true of these Jewish believers also in a different context. The 40 years of wilderness wandering here was a physical consequence of disbelief. It was never affecting the salvation of those who were truly regenerated. However, they died in the wilderness. If these Jewish believers here willing to do a mistake, a major boo-boo to go back to the Levitical system, they will die in plain immaturity as much as the people of the people of the wilderness wandering, they never saw the promised land. Even Moses did not enter the promised land. Would you question his salvation? No. It's a physical judgment that they're facing. And the overall context is the full 
chapter 1, verse 1 to chapter 6, verse 5. The fact that they want to go back there, do not isolate everybody, almost 100%. They give it soteriology, you can lose your salvation. This is a violation of the wider and the immediate context of the book. Result, Kadesh Barnea, physical judgment, lost of reward for them here at the judgment seat of Christ. So in light of the immediate context, the impossibility to renew them to repentance means they won't be able to change their mind. They won't be able to repent because they, they won't be able to repent. They won't be able to change their mind, meaning staying in immaturity instead of pressing on to maturity. Staying in immaturity, babes, instead of pressing on. That's a change of mind. They need to repent, to leave the ABCs of the Christian faith and move to the ribeye of Melchizedek. It's not a soteriological repentance here. It's you change your mind about your babyhood attitude of willing to go back there. Press on. Because you will never be able to go back to mature, to go to, to press on to maturity if you die physically in AD 70. That's the context. So what's my message for me tonight and you? It's not in my notes right now. And it's always dangerous when Francois does not abide in his notes. I do not want to see you physically die in a state of immaturity. Because if you die before me, I will feel obliged to go see you at the hospital. You know the price of gas. I want you to go in complete peace like we should. This guy knew his God. He was known by his God. He was chosen by his God. Death, physical death for us, is a graduation. How he died. It's a graduation, leaving that place, that completely meaningless planet here. But we love it so much, that's why we stay immature. Christmas is in weeks. Leave it alone for one year. Let's mm, move on. That, that's the context of it. They won't be able to change their mind. And once you will be, Francois, is bed dead in immaturity, it will be too late for Francois to get in his books and press on to maturity and apply what I need to apply. It will be too late. Am I going to go to heaven? That's the, it's hard to hear. You're not going to love me tonight. You don't want to hear that kind of stuff. It's not what we want. But what's what, that's what we should do. And then it will attract the people. What's nicer than your wife when she, with a nice new dress and, the, oh, honey, you look fantastic. The word is attractive. That's why Christianity has lots of its attractiveness. We're boring to the bone. And we doubt. And the, the child, they see us doubting afraid, doing things to great brownie points, and they don't like it. Enough, because I will transgress. Next week, verses 7 and 8, until the end of it, I'm not going back. I'm not going back to that passage. It does not teach the losing of salvation. For me, and I make a commitment, I will not change my mind. Bruce, would you finish the meeting, please? Sorry, I didn't hear that. What was that? <laughs> Bruce, pl please pray.